Hi, my name is Tom Coolidge, and I am Esri's Pipeline Industry Manager. I am facilitating today's webinar. Along with my colleague, Jeff Allen, Esri's Global Pipeline Practice Lead, welcome to our focus on advanced data management for pipelines. This webinar is part of the Petroleum and Pipeline webinar series. I think you'll find our time together today to be interesting, informative, and helpful. Now, please welcome my colleague, Jeff Allen. Jeff? Thanks, Tom. Morning, everybody. We've got a full house this morning, probably one of our most well-attended uh, webinars so far in the Pipeline series. So we're really excited about this topic. And um, what we're really going to be going over today is talking about some of the new technology that we've been putting together for managing pipeline data. Um, that might be inside a station, that might be along a transmission line, sort of all along that pipeline supply chain. And I'm going to kind of be taking you some, some, some key tools. If you've kind of seen any of our recent presentations, you know we really kind of focus on these common operating patterns that we find within organizations. And so these are the common patterns, and really what we're going to be focusing on today is, is really on that system of record of that data management uh, pattern that we have. So one of the things that we're really focusing on is trying to solve business problems by applying the appropriate pattern. And then the patterns then lead us to the underlying ESRI technology. So as we're talking to folks in the organization or in the business, we're going to really focus on these on these sort of organizational patterns, then move our move our solutions into the into the ESRI stack. As we look at how GIS is being used across these organizations, you know, traditionally we've seen uh, this technology start in, in with the departmental solutions, basically in these asset management groups. Uh, and that's where we've been maintaining the GIS data, maintaining the MAOP and traceable, verifiable, complete, really kind of building that system of record that the rest of the organization then leverages. And then traditionally, the largest consumer of that data has been the pipeline integrity groups within these organizations. But as we start moving out to the rest of the organization, we start seeing more and more demand for a higher fidelity in that data. And really what we're trying to do is kind of build that digital twin uh, of those pipeline facilities so we can meet the needs of the rest of the organization. And then really when we start talking about the pipelines, you know, we have multiple different organizations or multiple un different units within many companies that we have to really address. So we've got the upstream folks, the midstream transmission pipelines, all the way down into the facilities and into the downstream and distribution. And really what we want to do is pull a set of tools together that allow us to manage pipe anywhere within this whole supply chain in a common geodatabase with a common set of tools and be able to literally be able to trace anywhere from those upstream gathering lines all the way down to the uh, to the supply chain and be able to haul all that linked together in one cohesive system of record. So when we start talking about that, we really start talking about managing in a single system everything from the well tip to the burner tip or to the meter tip, right, and all that pipe in between. And what we've been doing at Esri is, is really kind of coming up with a, a way to manage all that pipeline data in a seamless single geodatabase. Now, there's a lot of different business requirements, a lot of different editing workflows that happen through all that supply chain. And so sitting on top of that data repository are really two pieces of Esri technology that allow us to seamlessly manage that data in one central repository. One of those pieces of technology is the ArcGIS pipeline referencing, and we typically use pipeline referencing in the transmission space. And then the new utility network, which I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on today uh, showing you and demoing to you, which is really to maintain that data that's in that network uh, type of, of operations. That could be distribution, that could be gathering, it could be inside a facility. Now, one of the other things that's really kind of shifting this landscape uh, of these editing tools is traditionally we've had desktop users connected directly to the backend database, right? That client server architecture that we've been implementing for years. Both the ArcGIS pipeline referencing and utility, ref, uh, utility networks really use this new web services system architecture. 
And so what that allows us to do is, is edit the data that's in that backend database, but really kind of leveraging more of the power of the server to be able to do that. So all those editing requests, whether they come from a desktop tool or a web tool or a mobile tool, go through that web server, and then those edits get applied to the backend database. So that allows us to do a couple of different things. Obviously, it allows us to move that editing experience out into different platforms and not have to recreate the wheel or recreate those applications. It also allows us to protect that data better, right? So as those devices are placing those edits into the backend database, we can kind of protect that data, run it through a rule base, and make sure everything that's being applied uh, meets all the business requirements of that data as it's being stored in the system of record. So this is kind of a shift, and you'll see that. I'll, I'll show you that in the demo of how this is set up. But those of us who, who have traditionally set up these systems with a direct connect to the database, uh, when you first start using the newest version of ArcGIS Pipeline Referencing and Utility Network, it takes a little bit of getting used to to, to be editing web services and, and have some of this logic sitting on the web service tier as you're, as you're editing data in the backend database. So I'm going to spend a lot of time today really talking about the new utility network, but I really wanted to take a moment to just remind everybody, and we've done some previous webinars and we'll do some more in the future specific to the pipeline referencing tool. So for you who are on the phone that might not know what the ArcGIS pipeline referencing tool is, basically what it allows us to do, it's a, it's a number of tools and technologies that allows us to enable linear referencing on, on uh, features within the geo database. So, from that perspective, I can create a route, and then I can place linear or point events on top of that route and manage that data that way, right? We typically see this data management technique used in the, in the transmission operators uh, from a pipeline supply chain perspective. Now, the ArcGIS Pipeline Referencing Toolkit comes with a couple of different components. It comes with an information model, which is a set of feature classes and tables that we can enable into many of the industry standard pipeline data models to, to enable linear referencing. So that comes as a component that you can implement. It comes with the desktop tool that's in ArcGIS Pro for editing and maintaining the, the routes themselves. It also comes with an extension to the server. And this really ties into that sort of new paradigm of, of edits going through a server component. So we now enable linear referencing capabilities at the server. And a web editing application allows users to edit point and linear events along those transmission lines. And of course, that web application is going to use or highly uh, leverage the ArcGIS server to place those edits back in the, in the backend database. So this is pipeline referencing, and, and this is what we're using in transmission right now. And the goal here is to now sort of tie this in to the next application that I'm going to show you which is the ArcGIS network management extension, a utility network management extension. So this is a new tool, again, built for Pro, that allows us to really uh, edit and maintain those network type of, of, of scenarios within the pipeline system. The goal eventually is to have uh, the ArcGIS net utility network underlaying all the pipe segments from the wellhead through gathering, through transmission into distribution, and where in that supply chain we need to have linear referenced objects, they would then sit on top of those utility network uh, features in the geodatabase. So think of the utility network, if you're a transmission operator, it will most likely maintain your assets, uh, all the fittings and features that are under pressure. So your pipes, your valves, your fittings, your T's, and then your linear reference objects will sit on top of that. So I'm gonna show you today how we're leveraging this new utility network in the pipeline space, because not only can we map those traditional pipeline segments, but also start looking at a little more detail about how we map some of the things that's really been difficult or challenging to do in linear referencing, like station pipe and meter stations and compressor stations and, and other sort of assemblies that, uh, that might have detailed data that we need to support operations, but a little challenging to do in the linear referencing system. I think that's where utility network, at least in the pipeline space, is really going to find its, its first adoption. So the utility network itself provides the ability to model and edit uh, networks using, obviously, the, uh, 
the uh, Esri platform, uh, the platform clients. Specifically, I'm going to be showing you that editing experience in Pro today. So again, like pipeline referencing, this is a new tool designed specifically to work in the ArcGIS Pro platform. Uh, it's really meant to be offer up a better representation or a true representation of those assets in the ground. Uh, it's been redesigned to be very responsive to editing and analytic capabilities. So from a per performance perspective, it's really been retooled from the ground up and now includes a rule base to, to really allow us to better maintain and manage the data uh, coming into the system of records. So we can now do things like create a rule that says, hey, if I have a 12 inch pipe connected to an eight inch pipe, I need a reducer in between and be able to up now sort of enforce those business rules as data is being added to the, to the database. So really, you know, when we talk about ArcGIS pipeline referencing, one of the things we talk about is that uh, information model, right? Those tables and feature classes that are that are enable the ArcGIS pipeline referencing to run. And very similar to that in the utility network, we have this thing called an asset package. And so the asset package are those key features that allow us to maintain the data in the utility network, right? So you can add all kinds of things to these geodatabases, but specifically for the utility network, there's going to be some key features classes that we're going to put into the geodatabase to enable this functionality. Um, at the shared level, there's a couple of different shared feature classes for structures that are shared across a number of different domains. And then specifically, we've kind of blocked off the domain networks into their kind of higher level uh, functionality. So there'll be a gas and liquid pipeline network domain, one for electric facilities that will have different uh, functionality and different features that are, are germane to electric networks, and the same for water. So if you're a pipeline operator, you would have those shared structures, and then you would implement the gas and liquids pipeline domain into the geodatabase. So if we drill down a little bit further into that, uh, into that gas or liquid pipeline domain, you'll see a couple different things. We've really kind of streamlined the number of features, uh, both from, from a performance reason and, uh, and a simpl simplification of the model. So underneath there, you'll find a couple of key features. You'll find devices, lines, junctions, assemblies, and subnetwork lines, right? Those are the major feature classes that you'll find when you open up this information model and implement it inside the, the geodatabase. And you'll say, see, see that same thing if you were to say implement the electric domain as well. It, it has those five major components. And then what we're really doing inside the geodatabase is leveraging um, asset groups and asset subtypes to really model the different features within inside of there. So inside of the, inside of the pipeline, um, network will find a, a device, for example, a subtype of device might be a meter, and then the asset type is a coded domain that then further classifies what type of meter it might be. So instead of having, you know, 50 or 60 different feature classes out there, we've really kind of boiled the ocean down to these five and then heavily relied on subtyping to be able to split those out. So as a user, you really don't see that, but as a as an administrator or GIS professional, if you were to go behind the scenes into the geodatabase, you'd see this sort of collapsing of these of these features down to these really kind of core five that the utility network is really responsible for. And so for if you want to see that how that was implemented in a larger pipeline data model, right? If you open up the UPDM 2018 edition, you'll see those domain asset classes now. So if you were to look at the UPDM 2017 versus 2018, you'll really see this shift where we've uh, kind of collapsed a lot of these feature classes down into those domain assets. But you'll also still find all the other stuff that doesn't necessarily uh, participate in the utility network. So you'll find the pipeline referencing tables, the inspection data tables, the integrity and compliance tables, the asset inspection tables. So all those feature classes and tables and relationships are still there. But really the key is to look at these sort of oil and gas domain network tables. That's where the real change has been in the UPDM 2018 edition to really support the, the utility network. So there's about five or six different 
major components that make up the utility network. And what I'm going to do is really attempt to take you through in, a, in an overview sense these five or six different components to show you kind of what the uh, landscape and what are the different functionality that you could uh, you could look for as you're implementing utility at work. This thing is pretty big. It's been worked on for quite a number of years. It's got a lot of functionality to it. I don't uh, propose that I can get into everything in an hour, but this should give you a good sense of all the different things you can do and, and really get you thinking about how you might be able to implement this within your organization. The first part of it I'll show you is really talking about the editing workflows, right? And so on the editing side, really the utility network takes advantage of the core uh, editing workflows that are in ArcGIS Pro, right? So I'll have all the tools available to me to do things like alignment, reshaping vertices, dividing, all those sort of widgets that are part of the editing workflows are available to me in the utility network as well as a lot of feature panes and ways to set up templates to make editing for your users really easy. An example of that might be these group templates. So here's an example of a group template uh, from the water domain where they place a hydrant and that hydrant has a gate valve and a lateral and reducing T all associated with that single, uh, single edit. So if you think of it in the pipeline perspective, this uh, a, a good group editing template might be a valve assembly or a launcher receiver assembly where I'm where I'm making uh, kind of group templates so that I place that object, I'm actually placing five or six different features at the same time. And then I could modify those for the specific implementation. But I, in, inside of my pro project, I can kind of build up these group templates and make placing of features or, or these complicated features a lot easier for my editors. Now, also in that editing workflow, you're also going to start uh, looking at the rule base, right? So inside of that server, we now enable a number of different rules that can be enabled against those edits as they're being placed in, in, into the database. Some of these rules are applied real time to the editing. Some are applied after. So for example, one of my rules might say, hey, I can only attach this type of of T to a steel pipeline, right? That would be a real-time rule that this, that I would want to see as I was placing that T. Another type of rule might be that edge junction edge connectivity where I really can't apply the rule until I've placed the three features and then I can check those three features against the master rule base. So the major kind of rules that we have obviously is junction to junction connectivity, like what, what junction can be attached to what other junctions. We have junction edge connectivity. So at the end of a pipeline, what type of junctions or what type of features can be attached to it? I have my edge junction edge rules. Again, that's the that's the pipe to reducer the pipe kind of example. I also have rules for containment, and I'll kind of go through what containment is uh, as well. But basically, it allows me to build up features sort of like GIS within a GIS. And then the final rule kind of is uh, structural attachment. So what large objects from a structural perspective can be attached? So for example, a pipeline support can be attached to a pipeline, right? Those rules of, of the structural attachments and what can be connected to the pipeline features themselves. And this is just an example of looking at that in the, uh, this is the example of that judge uh, valve, I'm sorry, edge junction edge rules. So you can see it's they can be pretty detailed. Uh, in the template um, package that we deliver with the software, uh, we have a number of these rules already set up for you. You can edit these rules, you can add to them, you can remove them. So part of the project or part of the process of implementing utility network is to uh, look at these rule bases and then modifying them appropriately uh, for your organization. Now, as we look at these rules or as we apply these rules to the geodatabase, the way we do that is uh, by creating these uh, sort of error layers. So if there is an error in any of these rule bases, what we do is we create either a point line or a polygon feature in the, uh, in the rules layer that you can go back, see what, uh, what rule didn't, was not applied correctly, make that edit, and then revalidate against that rule base. So let me jump back into my ArcGIS Pro project and I'll show you an example of those rules and we'll look at some of the editing workflows. So 
So what I've done is actually take, if you any of you have seen our pipeline uh, demo, uh, we have some transmission lines, some gathering lines, some offshore lines. What I've gone and done is, is integrate my utility network demo in with my pipeline demo data set. So you'll see now that I have some utility network features in my, in my, uh, in my map, I now, just like a location referencing toolbar, I get the utility network toolbar, right? And this is sort of a context sensitive tool that will be turned on as I, as I have features from the utility network loaded into my, into my geodatabase. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to kind of zoom in here. And one of the things that we've often seen from a pipeline perspective is we'll have a transmission line, we'll get to a facility like this tank farm, and maybe I have just a polygon representing the site, or maybe I actually have the points that represent the tanks inside. But what's been really difficult from a sort of linear referencing perspective is to actually dive into this tank farm and start mapping out all the facilities with inside of here, right? So this is from a from a pipeline perspective where I see I see a lot of of operators starting to look uh, take their first look at the utility network is to be able to do this type of mapping of these station facilities uh, in these pipeline stations and start to map this stuff. Uh, obviously, uh, trace is a big functionality here. Be able to link this to operations so. You know, if I have a whole bunch of meters or a whole bunch of valve inspections that need to happen inside the station, we will obviously map these out and not just have them tied to a single polygon it would be key. Uh, another advantage here is I can start running, say, station risk on all these pipes. So now I can see, you know, within this station, what is my sort of most uh, risky piece of, of pipe or, or assembly within here so I can do my risk mitigation on here as well. So this would be an example of a, of a larger station, but I also think we've got some real use cases, you know, in line. So here's an example where I'm, I'm moving down the main line itself, and I have some station pipe along that. So the red line would represent the transmission lines coming into here, and in, in my uh, RTS pipeline referencing, maybe this is my route into my launcher or receiver assembly and coming out the other side but I've never really had an efficient way in my linear referencing to sort of go ahead and model you know, all this piping inside of the station and, and make it make sense from a, from a, a network side of view. So I see the, the advantage of being able to now to come off the transmission line, uh, trace into this uh, utility network piping, the station piping that's here, come back out the other side of the station and continue down the transmission line. So let me show you how this would work, right? So if we look over here, I've got some feature classes and you're really seeing now that sort of boiling of the ocean I was talking about. So we've got assemblies, devices, and junctions, and pipelines. And if I open this pipeline junction table up, for example, you'll see all those subtypes, right? So now I see the couplings, the elbows, the end caps. So I have as many features as I've always had, but I'm really using sort of major my, my major features and then using subtypes to kind of uh, organize this within the geodatabase. And if I right click on this layer, look at the properties, and I look at the source, you can now see that this is being actually pointed back to that server and the rest endpoint. So instead of making a direct connection to that feature class in the geodatabase, I'm editing this feature class coming right off the server. I can also go in here and start looking at the rule base as well, right? So if I right click here and look at properties, I've got the properties of the utility network. And I'll just open this dialog up a little bit more here. And if I look at network properties, I can see I have a whole bunch of, of, of uh, data about the network itself. But down here, you can see I can expand this rules. And if I want to expand the junction junction connectivity, I can really easily now review all the rules that I have in the rule base for that type of uh, that type of rule. So again, these rules are stored at the server level. I'm accessing it here in Pro, so I can see all the rules that I have set up. And there's geo processing tools that allow you to go in and add and edit the rule base as needed for your organization. And then as I apply the rules and I check the data, any errors against those rules are going to be shown here in this uh, utility network layer.
All right, so I'm going to have any, any point errors, line errors, or polygon errors going to be shown here, as well as any areas that I do editing in that need to be validated. So we call those dirty areas, right? So as I do editing in this, in this area, it'll tell me all the features or show me a, a representation of all the features that need to be validated against the rule base using the validation tool on top of the utility network. So let's go ahead and do a, a quick edit here. I'll show you how easy it is. So here I've got a station. I've got um, I've got some facilities coming in here. I've got a, a maybe a, um, a takeoff to a to a customer uh, at a station. I'm just going to go ahead and connect all this together. So what I'm going to do is go back to the editing tool, and I'm just going to hit the standard create tool here, and let's go ahead and place a T on that line. So I'll search, I'll, I'll select the T object here, and I'll move it back over onto the utility network. Now you can see I've actually got my snapping turned on, but I cannot snap this T to this blue line. That's because I have a rule that says only a metal T can be snapped to this metal uh, pipeline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the editing template here, and I'm actually going to tell Pro that I'm placing a metal three-way T as an attribute. And you see, as I move back now onto the utility network, it's going to understand that that's a valid rule in my rule base. I'll go ahead and snap that, and I'll go ahead and apply that and, and place that into the utility network. Now, from here, I can also go ahead and place, let's go ahead and put a piece of pipe in here now. Put a piece of station piping. And again, same idea, I'd fill out all the attributes, but for now I'm just going to tell it it's coated steel, connect it to my new valve. And then we'll go ahead and put a flange on the end of that line. And then maybe go ahead and put the valve on the other side, the customer valve. Now you can see I've got that dirty area there, right? It's telling me that I haven't run the rule base against all these features. So I'm just gonna go back to utility network. I'm gonna check all those data edits I just applied against the rule base. It'll validate all my topology for me and give me the indication that that was successfully validated. Now, one of the last things I want to do is go ahead. You can see I don't really know that pipe that's inside of that facility, but I know that these two things are connected together. So I can now use my node-to-node -node connectivity. I don't have to sort of build that false piece of pipe between those two features anymore. I want to go ahead and, from a model perspective, go ahead and connect those objects together. So again, I'm going to go back to the utility network, and I'm going to hit the Modify tool here. And I'm going to modify my connectivity. I'm going to select this flange here. And I'm going to add this valve. I'm going to go ahead and apply that. Those edits are complete. I'll go ahead and validate that. And now those, all that pipe is now connected together through that station. And if I want to see that that point-to-point -point connectivity, I'll just go ahead and clear this up. I go back to utility network. And I hit this view association tool, you can see that dashed line there now. Uh, I've got those two pieces connected together. So now as I, as I trace through the network, those two things are now connected in the model. And I can jump on to this, uh, to this customer piping and trace out the other side.
So that shows you kind of some of the editing validation and rule bases that are going on behind the scenes in the, in the utility network. So the next thing I want to talk about is this concept of that the utility network has of containment. And basically what this container allows us to do is, is have this ability to really go down to the next level when we're, when we're modeling features within the database. So in this example here, I might have a, a point or a polygon representation of a pump station. And I want to then now model in all those facilities that are inside of that station, right? So now I can build a container and that container can now have all those features inside and connect them all together. Uh, containers can contain other containers, right? So I can have inside of that station, I might have a valve assembly container and that valve assembly has all the details of the, the flanges and the fittings and all the things that go inside of that. So I can have these sort of uh, hybrids of containers. Um, features are geographically placed inside the container or they can look like a schematic. So I get that both the ability to sort of place features where they are inside that station or just really kind of represent them in more of schematic mode. And then those features do all connect back to the larger network topology. So as I run a trace or run on my analysis, it's actually going to trace into those containers and all those connected objects and back out the other side. Now we can also set up rules for these containers that I can say what objects can be contained with inside of another object. So for example, I might not be able to place a mainline valve inside a pump station, right? So I can now set up these rules to say how things could be contained within other things to keep my data clean as I start building these. I can also set up rules of what happens when deletions happen. So for example, I can't, if I have a restrict set on, right, I cannot delete the container until everything else inside of it is deleted. Or maybe I want to have a, a cascade rule that says if I delete the container, I delete all the objects inside of it as well. So again, these are all configurable items within the rule base for containment. So let me jump back to my demo. And we'll go back to that tank farm. And again, I'll zoom in to this facility. And you can see I come in the mainline valve here or the mainline pipeline and I go into this pump station and I've got three lines coming out to the rest of the, the rest of the different pumps coming out of this. So I've got the flanges here, but I've got a lot of stuff that goes on inside of this, of this pump station as well. And if I want to look at that next level of details, I'll go back to the utility network. I'll say, I want to enter a container. I'll select on that container and I'll jump inside. So what this will do is open up the container for me and show me all the pipes that I have inside, right? And here I've laid out those three different pump stations inside of there. I've got the meter coming in. I've got all the bypass piping, the NTs, the isolation valves, the bypass piping into the bypass valves, right? I've got this next level of details. I enter this station. All these things are traceable. All these things can be tied to the work order management system if I need to come into the station and do events, and they're all tied into this container. Uh, same idea as I had at that meter station. I have you know, these valves here. They don't look like they're connected to anything, but I can turn on those connectivity rules and see what's going on inside the station. You can see that, that valve itself that I've got sort of placed here more schematically is tied into the two flanges on the upstream side. And I could then, if I wanted to, maybe make this whole pump and its bypass valve another container with inside this station so I could dive even deeper down. Uh, but the nice thing about this is from a mapping perspective, when I'm at this level, I'm not having to show all that detail or try to draw all that detail. I'm just drawing the station itself and represent it on the map, even though all those details are behind it. So let me show you how easy this is. If I go back to my uh, my pump station. I have a container here, uh, this, uh, this uh, station uh, building here that I've already placed. And what I want to do is I want to add these objects into that, inside of that container. So I'm going to go back to the utility network toolbar. I'm going to hit this modify tool again. Instead of connectivity this time, I'm going to say containment. I'm going to select my container. 
And then I'm going to go ahead and add the content that I want to be part of that containment. Right? So I'm going to add that flange. I'm going to add that control valve. I'll go ahead and apply those. I'll make sure that those objects can actually sit inside a container. So I'll run the rule base against them to validate that. It did. I'll clean up that selection. And now you can see I've got those, I've got those objects. If I go in here now and enter this container, I can enter in there and see those objects. Now, if at any time I want to view those objects at the mapping level, I have this little display content here too, rule here too. So I can go ahead and even show them at this level. So I'm at this level and I want actually want to see the content at the at the higher level that are inside these containers, I can use this display content tool to go ahead and, and show and hide all those details that are that are inside these stations. So another kind of big component to the utility network are these terminals and subnetworks. And basically what these terminals do is allow us on a single feature to really define uh, the connectivity or different rules for connectivity or different what we call ports of how these things are connected, right? So any of the inside the rule base, any of these features, any of these devices can have these terminals associated with them. So, for example, a rule uh, for a valve, in this case, might be a check valve. So when I place a check valve into my into my geodatabase, not only do I place where it's connected, but I want to kind of connect it to the pipeline with its high side and low side so I know the flow of that thing. Uh, another example might be my pump. When I place that pump, I'm also going to have the high side and the low side pressure of that as it as it flows into the station. So it, it's really allowing me to get a fine-grained uh, detail on how these how these objects are then placed in. This could be extended into the CP objects as well. So in on my anodes and rectifiers, I could have my current in and my current out. Uh, on my flows, you know, what's the inflow, what's the outflow, what's the high pressure side, what's the low pressure side. This allows me to really dictate on those point features how they are actually connected to the pipes on either side of them. And then this really then ties into what we consider subnetworks. So once I have those objects defined, say for example my pumps, and I've defined the high side and the low side, I can now derive a subnetwork. And a subnetwork network is basically uh, think of it as a sort of a live trace where it's it's going in and looking at all the devices and all the lines that are connected to a device and then giving me a polyline representation of those things on the map. So in my example, and I'll show you in a second, going back to that pump station, I now have a subnetwork for my pressure systems. And that subnetwork shows me all the different features that see the same pressure based on that, on how I'll place that pumps, those pumps into the system. So if we think of this thing from a MAOP perspective, right, I can now start looking at, <clears throat> within the subnetworks, all the different objects in that subnetwork and what the lowest MAOP pressure might be. So not only do the subnetworks show you geographically all the things that are connected together, I can create summary attributes in the subnetwork networks that can pull a feature or pull an attribute from all the features that are in that sub network and bring it up to the uh, to the to the uh, summary object so in here I could say hey tell me the lowest MAOP of all these things that are connected to this to this pump or to this compressor um, so you can think of this now we now have the ability to do sort of MAOP of system and model and and uh, and analyze that uh, using subnetworks. The other way I can see subnetworks being used are CP systems, right? So those uh, uh, the the start of my CP system might be my rectifier, 
and I can then set a rule on my flanges that say, hey, the CP system, because this flange is insulated, stops. So all these objects are electrically connected, but the pressure flows through here. So all my objects inside of here are, uh, or other objects are, are see the same pressure. So I can start building up these sub networks to model different real world scenarios within my pipeline network. And so it's a hard concept to explain in slides. So I built a bit of a demo for this in this pump station. We'll jump back to there. So you remember when I was when I zoomed in and went inside of this of this um, of this pump station, I had three different pumps that we looked at. And I'll just go in here and turn the details on. Well, I already have them on, so you can see them. So I have the main line coming in. Obviously, that all sees the same pressure. I've got a regulator here that drops it down, so this all this piping on the top side of these pumps will see the same pressure. And then the out coming out of the pumps will see individual pressure systems coming out of there. So when I connected these pumps, and I connected the terminals of these pumps to the pipeline either side, I define names for those, for those networks. And I can go ahead and see those now. If I go back, I'll zoom out a little bit, so this makes a little more context sense. So from a pipeline perspective, like oh, I have all this station piping, but if I go to the utility network toolbar now, and I can look at the subnetworks, and I do a find, I can see all those subnetworks that I defined. So I've got the, the overall system pipeline, and I've got these pressure zones here. So let's take a look at pressure zone A, and I'll go ahead and activate that. And what it's going to do is it's going to isolate all those pipes for me that are part of that pressure zone. So what it's done is sort of grayed out all the pipes in the background, and now I can see all those pipes that are coming out of, the, out of pump A and where they connect to in the model, right? Now, like I said, these are also persisted in the geodatabase as well. And that's that final feature class that I've got out here. So you can see I've got this pipe subnetwork line layer. So I'll turn off my pipes themselves and turn on this subnetwork line. And now I can see persisted in the geodatabase. So I can now share this out to field users. I can share this out to web applications. There's sort of real-time dynamic trace of all the pressure networks that are inside of this, of this station. So the purple line is my pressure zone A, come out of pump A, pressure zone B is the green line, pressure zone C is is the blue lines here coming out of pump C. I've got the red line, which represents the high pressure transmission. And then I've also got the black, which is that pressure system downstream of the, of the regulator, but upstream of the valves inside that pump station. So again, these are polygon features. And if, I'm, if, if I identify one of these on the map, you'll see it shows me all those connected features and also gives me some summary objects as well. Uh, so you can define these summary objects or summary attributes, and they are then created as I extend the network. So if I added a new piece of pipe downstream of pump A, it's automatically going to be uh, added to the, uh, the pump station A pressure zone and into this summary polyline layer that I can then model and share out. So the nice thing about the utility network is these are all simple features. So if I go in behind the scenes and I look at what's going on with these points, lines, and polygons, these are simple features in the geodatabase that I can now share out my portal, put them on a web map, uh, and use them in all my downstream like sort of system of engagement activities. But they're all being maintained and built off of real attributes as I add these attributes to the, to the pipeline network. So I've got two more things I want to show you. One is now that I have placed all these objects, you have a number of different op options for being able to trace uh, through these connected objects. 
right? Trace is a is really a provides business value to be able to answer questions on, you know, what happens if we shut this valve off? What happens? Uh, what are all the devices downstream uh, that see this same pressure system or see the same device? Helps us integrate with things like SCADA and control room, do pipeline modeling, right? These are a lot of the different workflows that we've been looking for from a pipeline perspective that we can now meet with the utility network. And there's a number of different types of traces you can do, right? So the basic isolation traces, you can do pressure zone traces. You can, if you set up your, your CP systems, you can do chromatic protection or CP zone tracing uh, using all that underlying data that I've been showing you in the database. You can also have starting points. Uh, you can have barriers to the trace. So, uh, for example, I want to trace through a, through a valve. If, if that valve is closed, I want to be able to stop there. If it's open, I want to continue on. And then different ways that you can then put all that stuff together. So you can run these traces individually from Pro, but then there's also these kind of widgets you can call from the server. So you can build up these trace configurations and then publish them to your server so the business folks can use them in their day-to-day -day operations. So let me jump back now to the, to the demo and I'll show you a quick trace. So go back to that pump station. I'm on the utility network. I'll go ahead and set a starting point for this trace at this takeoff point here. And let's just do a, a simple connected trace. So I'm going to include the containers. So I'm going to go in and out of that, those containers. And I'll go ahead and hit run now. And now you can see all the devices that are connected together uh, from that trace. So you can see I did all those editing operations, entered that containment, connected those all together. All those features and all those pipes are automatically connected in the back end through the trace algorithm. Uh, traversability, for example, if I want to say my butt, I don't want to, I want to have a barrier for not tracing through close, closed valves. So I'm gonna put in a conditional barrier on this trace and say the device status of any devices that I run into is closed. And now if I run that, trace again, you're gonna see I run in and I stop at that closed valve. So different ways you can configure these traces. Obviously, there's all kinds of different functionality in here, how you output these traces, where they go, uh, different filter functions you can run. Uh, and then up here on the toolbar, obviously, you can see we have a number of different trace types. So we can do an upstream trace, a downstream trace, subnetworking trace, connected traces, uh, all kinds of interesting things you can run with this data set now that we have a, a connected model throughout the, uh, throughout the tool set. Now, the last bit of functionality I wanted to show you is these diagramming. So this is similar to what we used to have for schematics, but now the schematics are actually integrated in with the utility network tool. So on the utility network tool, I have the ability to take that data that I've created and apply that to a schematic network diagram in real time and have those things link back to the map. And so I have all kinds of different options in these schematics. I have tree layouts, smart trees, geo schematics, all kinds of different ways that I can represent those schematics. And then once I have those schematics created, I can then go ahead and share those out with the organization through my portal. So here what I'll do is I'll jump back to that tank farm. And what I did here is I took all the objects. Uh, I just ran a simple trace to find all the connected objects in this tank farm and then created this simple tree diagram of everything that's inside of that station. So you can see that upstream meter, this green box represents all the different objects that are inside of my container. And then you can see I run out to all the different, uh, all the different tanks 
uh, and how they're connected together to the different pipes that, that leads me back to my station. And then say if I select on this tank here and apply that to my map, I run back to my map, it automatically zooms me and shows me that that, that object in my diagram is, is connected to the object in my map. So these things are now forever tied together. As I add objects to my to my utility network, the schematic is automatically updated. And then I can go ahead and export or share those, those schematics with the rest of the operations. And all the, all the attributes that I have stored on these objects are available to these objects in my schematic as well. So I know I threw a lot at you in the last hour. Uh, there's a lot, but those, those are, if you, if you kind of look back at my demo and, and stop and start at this presentation at those, at those major demonstration points, those are kind of the major bits of functionality. Now, within inside those bits, I've only touched on a, maybe even not a tenth of all the things you can do inside of those components. So there's a lot more to this. So I've added to this presentation a couple of different links that I think are pretty important. The first one is to the Utility Network uh, overview page on, on the Esri site. This has a lot of different hyperlinks that allows you to drive down even deeper. Uh, the separate second link is an overview. It's a blog uh, article from the um, for the product team that also contains a lot of different links to other information about the utility network. And then the last one here is a link to the ArcGIS Pro help page. And this is really kind of guides you through and is a starting point to what is the utility network. And then you can actually dive down into all those different things that I showed you today and get more details about those. So this will be live links. We'll be obviously sending this presentation out to everybody. Uh, so once you get the presentation, you can then uh, you can then follow these links and get some more information. Really, as far as next steps go, um, you know, go ahead and look at that additional content that we've got on the web because there's a lot more data there. Uh, a lot of people now are looking at software evaluations and demos, you know, demo of, of your specific needs, use cases. If you want a software evaluation, if you want a demo, if you want to follow up with some next steps, please reach out to me and I can, I can arrange that um, either through myself or through your account manager. Uh, we also have within the Esri Professional Services, we can do pilot projects, proof of concepts, full implementations, help you with data conversion. We have those services work that go along with those, as well as engaging with our partners. You know, we have a lot of partners in the pipeline space. Um, this is by no mean an extensive list, but these are the partners that have sort of approached us and said that they're interested in, in being uh, or interested in starting or have already started utility network projects uh, with their customers. So I, I encourage you to reach out to partners as well to get help with this. And I want to thank you for your time, and I'm going to turn it back to Tom. We've got about 10 minutes left, or a little under 10 minutes. We can take some questions from the audience. Tom? Hey, thanks, Jeff. That was, uh, that was really good, very interesting. We do have, uh, I'm sure we have more questions than we're able to take um, in the time that's remaining, but as you said, let's uh, get started on the, on the first couple. The first question notes that uh, ArcGIS pipeline referencing can work on pods light, then continues, is there any plan to work on pods original versions, especially version four? And again, this is related to APR. Yep, absolutely. So when I was on the APR slide, one of the things I pointed out was the APR information model, right? These are a core set of tables and feature classes that enable linear referencing within the geodatabase. If you look at information model, you're not going to find pipes and valves and fittings. You're going to find just the core elements that we need. You could take those core elements put them into the pods four or pods five uh, information model and wire it up to those, to those existing events and start using those existing definitions of objects within APR. So APR is not, I like to say APR is data model agnostic. It can go into any data model. It can go into a custom data model. It can even be put into older data models uh, and brought forward using that technology. Okay, thanks. Um, the second question switches to the utility network. Does the utility network rules pertain to transmission lines as well? They do. So we have a we have the rule base that we deliver with the asset package that's posted up to the website has some default rules for distribution, gathering, and transmission built into it. 
I don't think that they probably are 100% for every organization, but it's a really good start. There's a ton of rules already built into the rule base to get you started. Okay. Uh, continuing with the utility network, our TIE, flange, et cetera, features also available for transmission pipelines. Yeah, so the way that we envision this to, to work going forward is that those same features, like the lines, the devices, and the junctions, whether they sit in the gathering, in the transmission, or the utility network, think of that pipe layer being continuous through all those different segments. And then in the transmission world, we would then lay on top of that pipe the linear referenced objects. So in a sense, if, if you're familiar with APR, the pipe layer becomes APR center line, right? And then now all the linear objects sit on top of that. Okay. Um, switching, well, perhaps related to both. The question is, can rules be applied to event editor? Currently, they are not. So currently, the rule base is tied to the utility network. So the rules would be uh, based on, on applying the, uh, let's call them the fittings under pressure, right, would go through the rule base. If there are additional rules that apply to, say, just the, the linear reference components, class, HCA, other regulatory layers that might be sitting on top, we could apply things like data reviewer uh, checks to be able to make sure that those business rules are being applied. But the, the rule base specifically that I showed today is tied uh, to the utility network at this point and the features that participate at that layer. Okay. And then perhaps one last question uh, here in this hour, and then we'll answer the others in an FAQ. Can subnetworks from different containers be displayed from the geo database at the same time? Yes. So the subnetwork polygon or polyline layer that is generated goes inside of those containers as well. So as I zoomed in and I showed the subnetwork for that 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 pipe that was on the high side of the pump, if that if that regulator or the upstream regulator in the transmission side was outside of that of that of that container, then that black polyline would have con would have gone outside the container and up into the transmission system. So yes, they, they can they can traverse inside and outside of those containers as well. Thanks, Jeff. We are uh, close to the top of the hour. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to all of the questions. We, we still have some more and uh, we will answer those in an FAQ uh, document that we'll make available to attendees. Please be aware that a pipeline track will be featured at uh, Esri's Petroleum GIS Conference in Houston, May 15, 16, uh, 2019. More details will be available early in the new year. We hope your schedule will permit you to join with the hundreds of users from the pipeline community who will be there. Thanks again for joining today's webinar. Have a great day.